there's a great line from a book from some years ago, the past is a foreign country, which is to say the past is so different from the present that it is, is foreign to us. And certainly, if you look at 20 years ago, I'm going to be talking a lot today about 20 years ago. 20 years ago, technologically, it is a foreign country. The, the, the World Wide Web, most of you had not heard of in 1992. It was the, still this obscure academic thingamajig. Um, the, the first national commercial online email was beginning exactly 20 years ago today, essentially. Uh, personal computers were big, clunky, standalone typewriters and calculators uh, on which only text was visible, and certainly not newspapers, certainly not magazines. Um, uh, there were no videos via computers, no, no uh, music via digital devices. Uh, the cell phone was around, but still a rare novelty just 20 years ago. Um, personal music players, they depended on cassettes, CDs. Um, uh, Nobody had seen a computer animated motion picture 20 years ago. DVDs didn't exist. The human genome hadn't been decoded. Genetically modified food didn't exist. The past technologically was a foreign country. Here is what's weird and what I'm going to talk about today. During the same 20 years, consumer technology aside, aside from the computers and telephones and, and televisions and the rest, the appearance of the world, the sound and look and feel of the, of the world in so many ways has changed hardly at all, less than it has during any 20-year period of the last century, which is just bizarre to me. Uh, for the first time in my lifetime, for the first time in my parents' lifetime, for the first time in my grandparents' lifetime, the recent past looks almost identical to the present. Think about it. Rewind any, to any period and then think, oh, what did things look like? What was that like? What was it like 20 years before? What was it like 20 years later? There's no chance, for instance, that you would mistake an image like this from any time but what? The 1970s, of course, the early 70s. People in the early 1950s did not look like this. People in the early 1990s, I hope, didn't look anything like this. Um, but the whole thing, the sideburns, the mustaches, the collars, the bell bottoms, the leisure suits, uh, I'm surprised this guy isn't smoking cigarettes because people still smoked cigarettes in 1972. And the streets as well uh, were filled with cars like this. Um, you all, those of you, some of you old enough to remember, remember the Dodge Demons and Dusters. This is a, an AMC car, the Javelin, uh, 1972. And again, I'm not a car guy, but I look at that and within a couple of years, I could tell you when it, when it was produced. And, and similarly, you could look at cars from other times and, and say, oh, that's, that's a car from the 40s, or that's a car from the 50s, and so forth. 20 years, it's a somewhat arbitrary number I've chosen for the purposes of this uh, examination, but it, 20 years is about how long it took during the 20th century for things to, ch for people and objects, uh, for the popular culture, for things, the world to change the way they looked in a, in, a, in a striking way, for, for things to turn over. Here's a fashionable woman from 1927. Uh, here is a fashionable woman from, in fact, less than 20 years later, 1945. Uh, we, we, we can identify those well, almost without thinking. Uh, and then 20 years later, uh, Twiggy. Uh, again, unmistakably different. Uh, after a passage of 20 years. And you can keep doing that. You can, you can do it, uh, as I will do a little bit of today, um, in, in all kinds of realms, in all realms that I've uh, looked at or been challenged to look at, the clothes, the hair, the music, advertising, the cars, all of it, in 20-year in, in periods uh, during the 20th century, they changed in this absolutely unmistakable, unequivocal way. But now... Here is the newly uh, inaugurated first lady in 1981 next to the newly inaugurated first lady in 2009, 28 years. And it's not the same gown, but it might as well be. Uh, there's very little difference. Um, here, uh, I, I uh, published a version of this piece in Vanity Fair, and this, these are some images. This is some uh, images from that piece. Um, again, you see a woman from the 50s, a woman from the 70s, manifestly different in those, those 20 years. 
Here below, you see Madonna from the early 19, from the mid 1990s, and Lady Gaga from 20 years later, from the 2010s. Um, not only do they look strikingly similar, their shtick is strikingly similar. Their music is strikingly similar. Um, now, anyone can identify, again, mo take movies. This is a 1923 silent, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. You look at that, oh yeah, that's a silent movie, that's 1920s. Very different from a movie that came 20 years later. This happens to be Casablanca. Oh yes, that's a 40s movie, and you can identify, we can all identify that as a 1940s movie, even if you didn't know uh, Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman and, and Casablanca. Again, 20 years later, very different looking movie. Doesn't this look like the early 60s? 1964, Topkapi, a uh, highly 1964 movie. 20 years later, uh, here we are. Um, perhaps you can identify this movie if you're of a certain age. It's 16 Candles, uh, a big movie in 1984 about uh, teenagers. That's about when things started to slow down and stop in the, in the way I'm talking about. The obvious superficial changes uh, really uh, ceased to happen. Here's another teen movie from 15 years later, 10 Things I Hate. Uh, you can pick, if you, if you study these, you can pick out the, the, the d differences by era, but it's, it's strikingly similar. And then eight years later, super bad. Three boys, hair, clothes, whole the mise-en-scene, pretty much the same as it was. Ditto with what is arguably more important and enduring uh, expressions of culture, architecture. Uh, think about the, the, the cutting edge, amazing new buildings, let's just say in New York City over the 20th century. Uh, in the early 1900s, up there uh, on the upper left, you have Grand Central Terminal uh, uh, built uh, uh, around 1910. Just 20 years later, you have the Chrysler Building. Those were, respectively, cutting-edge buildings of their eras. That's just 20 years different. That's how different things look. On, on the other, on the right-hand side of the screen, you see Frank Gehry's famous Bilbao Guggenheim Museum in Spain, uh, designed in the early 1990s. Next to it, a new building, built in and designed and built in the early and mid, uh, in the early 2010s, um, uh, in Lower Manhattan, by another equivalent cutting-edge architecture of architect of the time. You tell me how different uh, th those are. Um, the, the, again, we can go on and on. Cars, a 1950s car, 1970s car, and here is a car from 1990 something and a car from a couple of years ago. Have, has, has car design been perfected? Perhaps, that's the explanation. But as, as part of this general uh, sort of slowing of, of change, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. I find it absolutely extraordinary. The, the, the air on chair, the fashionable air on chair that I've sat in now for 20 years to do my work uh, is the same as the one I sit in today. The, the teapot I made coffee with before I left New York yesterday morning is the same fashionable Alessi teapot that I bought a quarter century ago. Uh, neither of which looks dated today. Um, the epiphany that I had, I, I, I'd, ha I'd been musing on this to, and boring my wife and friends with this uh, a, co a couple of years ago, and then I had a sort of epiphany when I saw this picture from the New York Times a couple of years ago. This is uh, two restaurateurs, Steve Rubell and, and Ian Schrager, who had just opened the first boutique hotel in New York, Morgan's. Um, this, I saw this picture two years ago when it was reprinted in the paper, but the picture was from 25 years before that, from 1985. Now, how dated is this? The, the cap is a little funny, but again, that's not a matter of looking dated. It was a little funny in 1985. Um, the, the, the collarless shirt, sure, that's a little dated. The, the fluffier hairstyles of some of those waiters in the back, 80s, but... If you passed people who looked like any of these people on the street today, you would not go, holy smokes, dude, get a load of that. Um, but if in 1990 you'd looked at a picture from 1965, 25 years earlier, it would look very different. You'd say, wow, those people are, are from the past. Uh, if uh, 1980 you looked at a picture of people from 1955, you'd say, wow, those people are really from, from a different period. 
A man or a woman or, or, or a teenager on the street in any year in the 20th century who was groomed and dressed like somebody from 25 years earlier would look like an actor in costume or, or, or a weirdo, um, but not anymore. Look at people on the street. Look at ourselves. The, the blue jeans and sneakers that were the uniform in 1890, 1982 and 1992 and 2002 are still the uniform in 2012. Look through a current fashion magazine or architecture magazine or, or, or listen to, to pop music. I, I challenge you, if you don't know that these things are from 2012, to tell me with any certainty or consistency that whether they're from 2012 or 2002 or 1992. Um, fashionable people today can even get away with looking like people from a century ago, a man from the 1890s and a man, a very fashionable man from 1912. That is a, unprecedented. Again, this, you, might, you might glance at this guy and go, oh, he's, he's a dapper fop, but you would not go, holy cow, what's he doing in that getup? Um, how did this happen? Well, coming off the 1960s, um, the, and, and you know of, if you didn't experience the 1960s, this discombobulating period where, where, where the, the, the new was privileged, the radically new and different and shocking uh, was, was what it was all about. Um, designers and artists and impresarios of all kinds began suddenly in the 1970s, in the popular culture, certainly, uh, looking backward for inspiration. Starting in the early 70s, you had all these movies and television shows that were about the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, whether it's The Great Gatsby, The Godfather, The Summer of 42, Happy Days, American Graffiti, Last Picture Show, Grease. Suddenly, the past was the, the focus of, of popular culture overwhelmingly. Even the one new big Hollywood species of that period of the, of the set late 70s and, and early 80s, the, the big adventure sci-fi blockbusters that Steven Spielberg and George Lucas created uh, in the Indiana Jones and Star Wars films, they were re re renewals and reinventions of B-movies from the 1940s and 50s. That was their genius. But it wasn't just the popular culture. In the 70s and 80s as well, serious architects rediscovered history. And postmodernism was invented, which is to say, Old-fashioned, ionic, and Corinthian columns were, were respectable again in architecture and pediments and pitched roofs and all the rest. And, and a whole movement of architecture uh, began that, that was set out instead of, to build, instead of building strikingly new neighborhoods or towns, to build towns and neighborhoods that looked like old towns and neighborhoods. S th similar thing happened in fine art. After a century, most of a century of... of of serious fine art that did not recognizably depict human beings in the real world, that became fashionable suddenly once again. Ditto for new serious orchestral music when, when, when suddenly in the same period dissonance was not required in order to seem serious as a composer. Now, and this hasn't stopped. Ironically, our, our, our technology has enabled this to continue and continue. The fact that we can now look at and, and, and access any sound or image from any period, certainly of the last uh, century or more, uh, enables us to, to stare at that and to, to revel in that again and again. It's, it's as though we've, the future has arrived and we use the future so much to stare at the past. Um, and, and so much of, of our cultures, of, of the new cultural uh, uh, expressions, primary MO, is, is, is the mashup culture, um, which consists, of course, of rejiggering and recombining old forms. Which means that, I, as I say, for the first time in a century, the very idea of datedness has lost the power that it possessed during the 20th century. Um, another driver of this, I think, is the fact that um, with the technology revolution, with the rise of that as the hot center of, of things, a great deal of the, the attention and interest and energy of the creative class, of the makers of the world, has shifted to, to those less visible, but obviously profoundly important things, away from uh, the things I'm talking about. But I think probably the most important part of, of the driver of this, of why 
<laughs> things are not changing the way they used to is because of this tremendous change technologically and, and in terms of the political economy, the rise of China, globalization, all of it, I, th th that is so disconcerting to so many of us and so discombobulating that the fact that all of this cultural expression, all the look and feel of things, the sound of things, has not, does not change very much, is very familiar, that provides a kind of refuge from this storm uh, beyond. But, and, and, and the question is, will this last? Is it, is it a momentary cyclical thing, or is, it, is, is, is our Western American civilization sort of nearing uh, out of gas? Um, or, as I see, as said with the cars, maybe cars have simply gotten to where they need to be and, and stylistic changes are no longer um, uh, going to happen as, as dramatically as they did during the 20th century. It, it, it recalls a book that came out exactly 20 years ago, Francis Fukuyama's uh, The End of History. Uh, and, I, and it makes one wonder, makes me wonder, whether we are at some kind of end of cultural history. Um, I hope not. I, I tend to be a big believer in, in, in the idea of historical cycles, that this pendulum swing back and forth, in, in the case of American history, according to the Arthur and Schlesinger, Sr. and Jr. and others, that lasts about 30 years, this pendulum swing. And perhaps that will happen in our culture, in, in this cultural realm, and perhaps, um, and, and I think it's a reasonable bet that we are on the verge of a cascade of newness, where where the, the, the unfamiliar and the surprising and the shocking are embraced again and, and pop up more and more. That this cultural era of the same old, same old will look different a decade or two hence. Um, I, one reason I'm hopeful that that's the case is I, 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 I have the sense that the, the great uh, uh, striking r rapid change in political economics and, and technology is at an end. Not that it won't keep changing, but that I don't believe that 2012 to 2020, 2030 is going to look like 1995 to 2012 in, in those terms. And therefore, some of that, let's embrace the new energy that uh, used to, we used to see in, in, in style and culture will return. You know, as a parent of young w women, girls, it's nice that there is no generation gap the way there was when I was young. It's nice that there, in my case, is no great automatic rebellion uh, against me, that, that my children listen to the same music that my wife and I do, that, that they like the same books and movies that my wife and I do, that they, they, they eagerly wear the hand-me-down clothes of their mother and grandmother. Um, so as a parent, that's nice, but as a citizen of the culture, um, I find it a little strange. And I find myself wishing for some kind of bracing, confident, countercultural tide to refresh this culture, which I think needs happening. I, for the, God willing, 20 or 30 years left to me, I would rather be shocked sometimes and surprised than simply see the passing parade and think, yeah, I've seen that, yeah, been there. Um, that's what I hope for. Thank you so much.